place in Luke chapter 15. We'll get back um, to that. We're going to be focusing on the story of the, the, I guess it's called the story of the prodigal son is what most people know it as, the man with two sons and the one son that leaves. But happy, first of all, happy Independence Day. Happy 4th of July. I know it's the 3rd of July, but we're going to kind of celebrate it over the next couple of days. So happy 4th of July. Um, of course, I've always liked the 4th of July, you know, not just for the barbecues and all that, but I've always really enjoyed just kind of the meaning of the 4th of July and just what that has always meant to me growing up and, and things like that. So I want to give you some perspective, um, the Christian perspective on, on the 4th of July um, this morning, and uh, hopefully we can think about um, where we're at in this country and where we're going and how we can be um, a positive part of that. So of course, the 4th of July is, is uh, what are we celebrating on the 4th of July? We're, we're celebrating, you know, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Okay, when the, when the Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4th, 1776, the Revolutionary War, you know, the war to, um, you know, free ourselves from um, the tyranny of England um, was actually underway already um, when the Declaration was signed. But let me just read for you. Um, the first um, opening statement of the Declaration of Independence. And then let's talk about um, this day, this morning, and what it means um, to us today in America. So in Congress, July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence reads, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. So here they're opening the Declaration of Independence and they're saying, they're basically the Declaration of Independence. We've all read, um, we've all heard the next statement that I'm going to read for you probably dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times in our lives. But the Declaration of Independence, as they opened here in the first statement, was actually a list of grievances. If you don't know um, these grievances, you should actually go and read the entire Declaration of Independence. You can read it in just a few minutes. But it's actually a list of grievances. It's actually a list of why they are what. What were they doing? They were declaring separation. They were declaring separation from the King of England. The, the mission statement is kind of how I look at the next um, paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, and it reads this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Well, there's, there's a lot right there. There's a lot in there, and there's a lot that's very biblical in that statement. A lot of things that are said, you know, they're just powers. Meaning, you know, that matches up, you know, with what we see in Romans 13, that the government is to punish evil. The government is there to be an enemy of evil. It's saying the government is to have just powers. And it says that they're to grant these rights, you know, that these rights were already there given to us by our creator. And in the paragraph above, it already talked about nature's God. So you can see that, you know, the existence of God, the existence of God is, is, is fundamental to the, the government, the Declaration of Independence, and the government that came out of, out of that declaration. Then the Declaration of Independence, I won't read any, any more for you, but you should read um, the rest of it. It just becomes a list of grievances. And I think that there's, there's a couple dozen of them at least. There's, you know, there's more than, than 25, I think. But it's a list of grievances, and many people think, okay, you know, it was just because of taxes, and you know, that was one of the reasons, but that was not um, the only reason that they separated from England. It was the entire list of grievances um, that are listed out in the Declaration of Independence. It's, it's all these grievances that basically equated to tyranny, is what they were, they were putting forth in the Declaration of Independence. And they, they had already tried to get the king to reverse um, these actions and these things that were happening. I'll talk to you a little bit more about those um, further in the sermon. But it, it just goes on to just list, here's why we're separating. And it's all these grievances that just amounted to this government just oppressing these people without their say in anything. All right, so that's what we celebrate 
on the 4th of July. It's kind of the, the birth of the independence of our nation, but it was marked by this declaration. Um, go ahead and read it um, when you have some time. If you haven't read it before, if you haven't read it in a while, it's, it's, it's good to know um, these things from our history. So, America. So we're talking about the foundation, the formation of America today, especially on the 4th of July or 3rd of July. And, you know, so the Constitution, so the war was fought. The war was fought after the Declaration of Independence. It was fought until 1783, I believe, is when it ended. And then we were an independent a nation at that point. The Constitution as we know it today was ratified a few years later in 1789. That's the law of our land. Okay, so that is how, you know, America kind of came to be, and it's what we celebrate on this weekend every year. So what is America? What is America, and how are we as Christians to look at America? And that's what I want to give you some perspective on this morning as Bible-believing Christians. So let's first look at the idea of a nation from the Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 11. Go to Genesis chapter 11. Keep your place in Luke 15. We'll come back there in just a few minutes. But let's look at this idea of, of what a nation is. I mean, what's the purpose of a nation? Why are there nations? Why are there many nations? Okay, what's the purpose of a nation? Where did this idea come from? Well, the Bible tells us everything, and all we have to do is look back in the pages of the Bible's history to figure out where nations came from. Look at Genesis chapter 11 and verse number 1. Now, this is after the flood. And the Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them over, over thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, us, go to let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name that we, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Look at verse number 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. As they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they imagined to do. Go to, let us go down. Now, this is another trinity in the Bible right here. God is saying, let us go down, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon all the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. So here we see how many nations were formed. They were building this tower, um, the Tower of Babel, as it's known, and they were getting uh, arrogant. They were thinking they could reach unto heaven, and God says they're, they're becoming too powerful. How can I manage this situation? So he separates them, he gives them different languages, and he sends them to different parts of the world. And then, of course, all these different languages, these different peoples, they go other places and they become all these separate nations. And the Bible tells you along, as you're reading the Bible, you know, who becomes what nation in many different places of the Bible. You know, it talks about, you know, what nation each descendant um, becomes. Um, so when you read the genealogies in the Bible, you know, don't, don't dismiss those because many of those, it tells you, become nations. So we have, have all these separate nations from Genesis chapter 11. Look at Genesis chapter 12, one verse or one chapter over. Now God, he sees he's scattered all these nations and all these peoples so they don't get arrogant and they don't, you know, just think that they can become gods themselves. And in verse number one, God defines his nation. God defines his nation in Genesis chapter 12 and verse one. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great, what? A great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee all the families of the earth be blessed. Now we know that, of course, the Messiah comes from that and that's how all the families blessed. But the point is, is what we see here in Genesis chapter 12 and verse number one is God, he's choosing his nation. He's like, this man will lead my nation. There's many nations, but there's one. Look, there must be an example. There must be an example nation. There must be a standard bearer nation for other nations to look at and, you know, take direction from. Look at Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 18. So the point is, is that God he separated all the people and made many nations, but then he chose an example nation through this man, Abram, Abraham. He later becomes 
named. And he, God says, you are going to be the one that carries forth my culture, my laws, and my word to the world. Okay, look at Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 18. The Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So the Bible here is defining the vision as, you know, where there's just basically all these other nations went off and they just, they just went and they did their own thing. I mean, look at all the nations of the Canaanites that they went into the promised land. These people were, they were just off worshiping. They'd made up their own gods that were no gods. They were sacrificing their children. They were in these horrible, violent societies. This is what happens when there's no vision, when there's no what? There's no law. So God defined his nation in Abraham to be the standard bearer to keep the law, to keep God's law. Now, Let's look at that, all that to say this. Let's look at America today. America today, unfortunately, you know, we see even in, even in the, the Declaration of Independence that I just read you, you notice in that opening phrase it said, one people. It said one people. Okay, it wasn't one race. It wasn't one, you know, it was saying one people, though. The problem in America today is there's no, there's no one culture today. There's no one culture in America. As a matter of fact, in America today, I would, I mean, I don't think that this is an extreme statement, what I'm about to say, but I would say that the two sides in America today are as divided as they have ever been in the history of our country. I mean, think about just the one, I mean, there's a lot of people in the center, I get it, but just think about the one side. You have all the false gods, you know, no gods. I mean, I don't believe there's that many no gods, by the way. I believe that most people are in the false gods or haters of God category on the extreme side. So that's one side of a culture in this country. And on the other side, who do you, I mean, who do you have? You have the lovers of God's word. You have the saved, the, the, just the, the believe on Jesus Christ and, and just like, let's just, let's just serve him with our lives. That's, that's the other side. Look, there's, there's no more... There's no more opposite than those two things that I just listed for you today. And that's the problem. So you say, like, how are we, like, because here's the thing. There's no nation. I mean, let's, even if you don't even look at the Bible and you just look at history, there's never been a nation in the history of humans that has been, that has been able to survive without a common culture. It's just never been able to happen. They always, it will always fall and fall apart from there. So you ask yourself this morning, how are we still a nation then? How is this possible? How is this possible that we could have these extreme haters of God and these lovers of the Lord Jesus Christ and these lovers of the Bible, of the Word of God, which are one and the same, by the way, and, and, and still have a nation? You know, how are we still a nation? Turn to Luke chapter 15. I'm going to give you my perspective this morning on how we're still a nation and how we should, you know, look forward in our lives um, about our nation. Okay, look at Luke chapter 15. So here we see in Luke chapter 15, we see this man who had two sons. One son says this. The younger son, in verse number, he said, a certain man had two sons, verse 11. Look at verse 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided, he divided unto them his living. So in Deuteronomy chapter 21, 17, let me just show you what he was asking for here. I'll just read this for you. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him the double portion of all that he hath. This is just talking about a man. Um, this defines like what the firstborn get versus um, the younger um, sons. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So in the case of a man having two sons, it says the firstborn gets the double portion. So in the case of a man that has two sons, the firstborn, the older son, would get two-thirds of his father's wealth, and then the younger son would get one-third of his father's wealth if there was only two sons, because the older son gets the double portion. So think about this for a second. This younger son was literally asking for a th worth. Right? I mean, first of all, that's pretty bold. <laughs> just, just go up to your dad and be like, hey, can I have my inheritance right now? You're kind of saying to your dad, like, hey, could you just die and give me your money? But... What does the dad do here? He actually gives it, he actually gives it to this son. Okay, he gives it to this son. Look at verse number 13. It's bold to say the least, but he actually, he does it. He gives it to him. He gives him a third of his wealth. Look at verse 13. It says, and not many days after, 
the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. So not only does he ask his dad for a third of his wealth, but he takes the money and he runs. He leaves. He leaves his dad. And then, and there he what? He wasted his substance with riotous living. And we see what he does with it. I mean, it talks uh, later on in the chapter, it says that he literally went out and spent it on harlots. Okay, so look, riotous living there means he took the money and he spent it on sin in his life. He wasted it on sin in his life. So what does he do with it? He wasted it on sin. He could have, he could have invested it. He could have started a business. He could have started a business. He could have been, been ambitious and worked hard. I mean, there's probably some young people that if you gave them uh, a decent nest egg right away, they would probably take that, work hard, and build that. But this guy just wastes the whole thing. He wastes it all. He takes it from his dad, and he wastes it all. I would submit to you that this is us today. Hopefully not us in this church, which we'll talk about this evening, but this is America today. We are the prodigal son. We are, we are taking in an inheritance that we've been given, and we are wasting it. And we're wasting it in the same way. We're wasting it on sin, on riotous living, on horrible things. We're taking that inheritance, and we are wasting it. Look, you ask me, do you, do you, if somebody would ask me, are you proud to be an American? First of all, I don't really like that statement because, look, pride is bad. Pride is always bad. There's no Bible verse that says pride is good in anything. So I'm not proud to be an American to where I think that I'm better than other people because I was, because I was born in America. I don't, I don't think that because I live in this country that I'm better than somebody from Russia or Europe or whatever. I, I, don't, I don't think that. And I don't think that's a right attitude to have. Even if we were like this godly nation that wasn't wasting our inheritance, I still don't think that's a right attitude to have. Okay, but let, let me tell you this. I appreciate this country. I appreciate this country. I mean, let me give you some, I mean, there's some bad news. I, but let me give you some optimism this morning. I, the bad news is really for the country as a whole. Okay, the bad news and, and those outside of God's will, that's who the bad news is for. But look. For the remnant, which is us, by the way, there's always been a remnant for 2,000 years. And we're the remnant today. For the remnant, there are still blessings here in America. There are still blessings here. And look, if you don't appreciate the opportunities, let me just say this. It's not the point of the sermon, but if you don't appreciate the opportunities that you have today in America, you simply haven't been anywhere else. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. You simply haven't been anywhere else. You haven't been to you know, Russia, or Europe, or Mexico, or Canada. I mean, even Canada. You simply haven't been other places, or the Middle East. I mean, you haven't been other places if you don't appreciate the opportunities that you have here today. But look, look folks, <coughs> there's a reason people risk their lives to get here. There's a reason people risk their lives to get here. We heard these stories in, when we lived in Texas. All the time, there was just another terrible story. A, a few days ago, about, about a semi-trailer with 50 people from Mexico, they, they all died. They all died because people are taking advantage of them. People are, you know, because why? Because they're easy to take advantage of because they'll literally do anything to get to this country. Why? Because there's opportunity here. That's why. I mean, it's terrible. It's a terrible story, but it's, it shows you that people, they're trying to get here so they can be, have part of that inheritance that was given to us 230 years ago. That's why they're trying to get here. Look, they're just prodigal sons from all over the world trying to get here to share in that inheritance. Is why people are trying to, just to get a piece of it. So appreciate, appreciate the inheritance that you've been given. Appreciate the inheritance you've been given in this country. Look, I mean, you say, so where did this, where did the inheritance come from? Here's a hint for you, okay? It didn't, your freedom, your opportunity in this country, it didn't come from Afghanistan. It didn't come from Iraq. It didn't even come from Germany, Japan, or Vietnam. It came from the foundation of this country. That's where it came from. That's where it came from. It came from the foundation. It came from a country that was founded on biblical principles 
and accepted, those principles were accepted by a population, by a nation that adhered to biblical principles. That's where the blessings, because that's all they are, is blessings. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Anything good that this country, anything good that America has ever done, it came from the Anything good, that's how you know. That's how you know that God was pleased to at least some degree with the foundation of the United States of America because every good gift, it, it comes from God, the Bible says. So God was pleased with that. So we need to understand, look, I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you that it came from, you know, from the blessings that God bestowed on the type of country that we started off being. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Let's look at this. Let's just think about this for a second. Let's do a little thought experiment on what the perfect type of government in the Bible is. Okay, what is the perfect type of government? Because I'm also not here to tell you that the government that was founded in 1776 is the, the or 1789 is the perfect type of government. I'm not going to tell you that either. Let's look at what the Bible says on the perfect type of government. Let's do a, a little Bible study on what God says is the perfect government. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 27. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 27. The Bible says, and he, this is Jesus. It says, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. So the Bible says that someday Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron. Look at Revelation 20. Just a few chapters over. Revelation chapter 20. This is referring to the millennial reign where Jesus will come and he will rule and reign for a thousand years. In Revelation chapter 20, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's us, by the way. That's us. We're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. But guess what? He's in charge. So you know what the Bible is saying? And most Americans, their ears will burn when they hear this. But, and, and I'll explain it to you in a second. But the Bible here is saying that the perfect government's a monarchy. The perfect government's a monarchy. I mean, we have a constitutional republic here. We don't have a democracy. We have a constitutional republic. But the perfect government's a democracy. But here's the thing. It matters who the king is. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the trick right there, right? I mean, look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament proves this. When you had good kings, when you had good kings like, like David and Hezekiah and Josiah, things were just really good. But then when you had kings like Jeroboam, things immediately were bad. And look, there was more bad kings than there was good kings. So to rephrase this, the perfect government is a monarchy with Jesus in charge. Or with, with God in charge, one and the same, right? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse number 7, which is exactly what we see in the Old Testament. Exactly what God is trying to tell us in the Old Testament. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse number 7. Remember when the people demanded from Samuel a king? They came into the promised land. They conquered all these lands. They, they did what God said for a while. They violated these wicked heathen people, and they took over the lands. But then they started making alliances, and they started getting ideas and intermarrying with these different um, nations around them. And they started getting ideas like, hey, these guys have a king. Maybe we should have a king. Maybe we should do what these other nations are doing, which is why God didn't want them intermingled with those people. Because he knew that they would come up with these ideas that would head them in the same direction. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse number 7. So they asked for a king, and God says this to Samuel. He says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people. Samuel was upset. He was upset that they were asking for a king. He's like, he's the prophet. He's the last. I mean, think of this. Samuel was the last judge. And he was the last judge because the people wanted a king. They rejected the judgeships, and they wanted a, a, a man to rule over them. And the Lord, Lord makes Samuel feel better here in verse number 7. He says, The Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, they have rejected me. 
that I should not reign over them. God says, God says, look, because here's the thing. The nation of Israel started out with God in charge. He was just in charge. He took them out of Egypt, and God was in charge. He used Moses as a, as a liaison to the people to give Moses the laws, but God was in charge, make no mistake. God would give the commands to Moses, and Moses would, you know, he was the division of labor for the Lord to help the Lord manage and run the nation. Then Moses had people that would also go out and help him as well. But God was in charge of that nation. Then we went to the system of the judges that, you know, we studied through the entire book of Judges. But then the people, they rejected the judgeships. They rejected the judges that, again, God was in charge. He gave the direction to these judges, and then they wanted a king. They wanted a king who was a man, and then it all went bad from there. I mean, the, the first... The first king of the northern kingdom of Israel set them off track immediately. The very first king. Then we see the kingdoms immediately split. Then we see the Assyrians destroy the northern kingdom. The Babylonians take the lower kingdom into captivity. Why? Why, though? It's because they rejected the Lord. It's because of what 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 7, it's because of what God told Samuel. They rejected me. And these are the things that followed after they rejected the Lord. So look, we clearly don't have Jesus today that's here to rule and reign. Look, we have his word. But what we were given in 1776 to 1789, what we were given was this limited government. You know, this limited government that had separation of powers. It was man's pragmatic, you know, um, view on how to, how to stop tyranny from taking place. It was separation of powers between the executive, the judicial, and the uh, legislative branches to stop. I mean, they're all to have checks and balances in place on each other. Jesus isn't here to rule and reign, but what was given to us in 1776 and 1789, I mean, it, from my perspective, was a pretty good idea. It was a pretty good idea, but here's the thing. One biblical truth remains. Look, here, here's how I know it was a good idea. Because God blessed it. God blessed it. God blessed what was happening in America in the late 1700s. He blessed it. But one, turn to Psalm chapter 50. One biblical truth remains. And it's a universal truth for nations. It's a universal truth for any nation that will ever exist as long as the earth is here. A people cannot, and the truth is this, a people cannot be free that reject the Lord. That, that's just, it, that, that's a main theme of the entire Bible right there. And this, look, this is what's happening today in America. This is why we are the prodigal son. When I say we, I mean our nation. We are the prodigal son. Look, here's what the Bible says, and we don't have time. We, we could read for several hours on all the verses of of, of, of what I'm about to show you. I'm just going to give you a couple little examples. But look, we see that a nation that turns and rejects the Lord, there is nothing in store for them but destruction. There's nothing. Look at Psalm chapter 50 and verse 22. Psalm chapter 50 and verse 22. The Bible says, now consider this. Ye that what? Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. If you forget God, you're done. No one can save you. That's what the Bible is saying. Turn to Amos chapter 2. Turn to Amos chapter 2. In the, in the minor prophets in the back of the Old Testament, you'll see Amos chapter 2. Look at Amos chapter 2. Amos chapter 2 in verse number 4. Look what the Bible says. It says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions. This is what we see for Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel again and again and again. Why do you think God puts these stories in the Bible for us? Why do you think God gave us such a detailed history of the nation of Israel. Why in the world? I mean, do you think just so we could have some good stories? You know, so we could, we could learn how this works. Look at verse number four. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of, Ju of Judah and, of, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because they have what? They have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments and their lies caused them to err after which their fathers have walked. But I will send fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. There's nothing for a company, for a, a, a nation 
that rejects the Lord, there is nothing but destruction in store for that nation. And there is no getting around that. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Look at verse number 18. Moses here is, uh, this is a song where he's warning the people. He's warning the people about what, what they've done in the past and to not do this in the future. Look at verse 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. That means he hated them. That means he hated those people because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. He hated the wicked because they were causing the unwicked to stumble. Think about that. The Lord hated the wicked because what they were doing to the godly. Look at verse 20. And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For fire is kindled in my anger and I shall, be, and shall burn unto the lowest hell. I mean, how could we get more strong language than this? And shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundation of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. That says this nation or these people that do this are going to have trouble. They're going to have trouble. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. They're going to have famine. They're going to have inclement weather. They're going to have drought. They're going to have wild animals come upon them. Look, what he's saying is that this prosperity is going to end for these people. He's saying that the good times are going to come to an end for these people. Verse 25, the sword without and the terror within. It's like they're going to have people attacking them from outside and people that are a terror within, which is what we're seeing here today. Destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. Look, I mean, enough said. We could just read and read and read. But the, the Bible is basically saying here, turn from the Lord equals the destruction for a nation. That, that's what the Bible is saying here. It's a major theme of the Bible. And, and look, we see it happening here. We see it happening here. We see prosperity going away. We see debt increasing. We see, you know, I mean, wars not going as we would like the wars to go, even though we're the most powerful nation in the world. I mean, think about this. We never lost a battle in Vietnam, but we couldn't win that war. Isn't that weird? Look, this is, be, this is the reason we have to pay attention to these things. We are heading down this road of destruction. And more specifically, as we think about Independence Day today, more specifically than destruction, I want you to look at this. Go to Proverbs 28.2 or look at the front of your bulletin. You say, yeah, but at least we're still free. You say, but at least we're still free. But the problem is, folks, is that the more we turn, the more trouble that we will have. And guess what also is going to leave? Look at Proverbs 28, verse number 2. This is such a good verse for us in this country today. The Bible says, for the transgression of the land, many are the princes thereof. But a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. You know what that's saying? You know what that's saying? Is that as, as we get further and further from the Lord, as we reject the Lord more and more in this country, you know what that's saying? Your freedom is going to go away. That's what that's saying. We just sang a song here. We just sang a song. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Song number 435. Go ahead and turn there and look at, look at the third verse. Look at the third verse. No, the second verse. At the very last stanza, look at the, the, the third and fourth of the second verse. Or the second verse. It says, God, mend thine every flaw. You know what that's saying? It's saying, God, God help us turn back to you. That's what this song is saying. It's saying, God, mend thine every flaw. And then look at the very next line. It says, confirm thy soul in self-control. Thy liberty in what? Thy liberty in law. The only way that we will have liberty is in God's law. That is the only thing we will have liberty in. If a land or a nation turns from God, they will have many rulers. They will be less free. Look, I'm all about rights. I am all about the Constitution. I think it's a great document. I think it was a great idea. But it's just a piece of paper. 
It's just a piece of paper. I'm all about the Bill of Rights, which was the, the Bill of Rights was the first 10 amendments to the Constitution that was, that was, that was added on in just a few years. It's 1790 or 1791, I forget which one. But it was the first 10 amendments. And here's what's interesting about the 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights. If you look at the Declaration of Independence and then you look at the first 10 amendments, those 10 amendments, they match almost exactly on, the, on the, the grievances that they had against the king. So what they did was they made the Constitution and then they, they documented those 10 amendments, those 10 freedoms, those 10 um, tyrannical things that were being done to them in the Bill of Rights and they added it to the Constitution. But if you read the Bill of Rights and then read the 24, 25, 26 uh, grievances of the independ uh, Declaration of Independence, they match. Because we're trying to guarantee that some man wouldn't come in, some bad king wouldn't come in and do the same thing that ha just happened to them. Okay, so look, I mean, it was a pretty good pragmatic um, solution. But the point I'm trying to get to you this morning is all, while I love those things, and I'm, I'm an advocate for those things, I'm an advocate for free speech, I'm an advocate for the Second Amendment, you all know this, but the point is, the reason that those things will go away, you know, is not Joe Biden. He's just a tool. The reason that those things will go away is because we have turned from the Lord in this country. That's why. We have turned from His Word. We have turned from His law. That's why our liberty will go away. Nations are judged by their works, folks. Nations are judged on this earth, and they are judged by their works. And you know what? Even the men who founded this country knew this. Even the men who founded this country knew that if we left God's law, we would be enslaved. Let me read you some quotes here. Now, I have a mix of, of uh, founding father quotes here. Um, some are people that I believe are sa were saved, and some are people that I pretty much know probably aren't. But it's irrelevant, because I just want to show you, I want to show you the contrast of the common thinking back then and contrast that with the common thinking today. So I'm going to read you some quotes from people who are probably not saved and some people who probably were. But you think about the common culture that these people had, even, even the unsaved. Think about that. John Adams, who I think was saved, he's my favorite. John Adams says this, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. John Adams also stated, think about these statements for a minute. Public virtue cannot exist in a nation without private virtue. You think it doesn't matter to be a soul winner? <laughs> Public virtue cannot exist in a nation without private virtue. You know what that means? That if you have a nation full of immoral people, you will have an immoral nation. It, it, seems, it seems, you know, like, duh. But why don't we get that today? Why don't we understand this today? Let me read this again. Public virtue cannot exist in a nation without private virtue, and public virtue is the only foundation of republics. George Washington said, virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government. Human rights can only be assured among a virtuous people. Notice this word virtue it keeps coming out. Benjamin Franklin. Only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. James Madison, to suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical idea. Chimerical means mythical. He's saying, he says, to suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness for anybody without virtue in the people, he's like, they're saying that if, if the people are not moral people, it's like, you're done. You know what they're saying? They're saying Proverbs 28 too, again and again and again. They're quoting Proverbs 28 too to you over and over and over again. But I point out um, some certain men here. I mean, Benjamin Franklin, if you read Benjamin, obviously, you know, I don't know who was saved and who wasn't amongst the founding fathers. I, I wish they were all saved because I, th I believe that they were all part of a great thing. But, you know, from their writings, you can read that they probably weren't. Benjamin Franklin was one of these guys that just looked at the Bible he looked at the, he was, was kind of like, I believe there's a God, and I believe that the Bible is a good set of rules to live by in your life. You know, I mean, so, 
You know, that's not a, a phrase of someone who's saved, okay? But here's the thing. Even those people, they, back then, they knew that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was de defined within the virtues of the Bible. Even those people. It was not, it was not the pursuit of sin and perversion. I mean, that's not what freedom meant. They're saying, they're literally saying that, you, just like the song I just read you, it's liberty and law. It's freedom and God's law. These people knew this. These people knew this. Look, sin, perversion, abominations, that leads to destruction, to damnation. That's where that leads. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse number 4. 1 Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is talking about charity. It's talking about, you know, charity meaning love towards our, fe fer, uh, our fellow man. Okay, it's talking about charity. And look what it says in verse 4. It says charity. The, all these verses are describing what charity is or what love towards your fellow man is. Okay, look what it says. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not to itself and is not puffed up. It's saying, if you're all prideful towards your fellow man, if you're all envying your fellow man, it's like, you're not, you don't love them. You don't have charity towards them. Because it's, it's saying, look, you're doing something, but it's not love. It's not charity. That's what, that's what the Bible is explaining to us here. It does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. It's not selfish. If you're some selfish guy, if you have a friendship, if you have a marriage, and it's just all about you, it's all about what you can get out of that. That's not love. That's not charity towards your wife or towards your husband. That's not love. It's not easily provoked. If you're someone that's just like a, you just like go crazy on people like immediately. Like that's not, that's not love. That's not charity. It thinketh no evil. But look at this. It rejoiceth not, rejoiceth not in iniquity. What people are saying, what people are saying that homosexuality love is love, it can't be. Because love does not rejoice in iniquity, sin. So either that's true or the Bible's true. It can't be pastors in America. Pick one. Please stand up and say you don't believe the Bible. Pick one. Choose the pastors who are cowards and say nothing. Drive me crazy more than anybody. There can be no love in abomination. It's not possible according to the Bible. So just stand up and say, this church doesn't believe the Bible. Be honest. Be honest about it. There can be no love in iniquity. Back to the sermon. Freedom is incompatible with a corrupt people is what I'm trying to get you to understand. And it's exactly what God tells us in the Bible. Even, look, it even makes intuitive sense. Because everything in the Bible makes logical sense. If something in the Bible doesn't make logical sense to you, you're not understanding it. Because, like, the Bible is logical. The Bible is understandable if you're saved. And, you know, it just makes perfect sense. It makes intuitive sense that freedom cannot exist unless people adhere to biblical moral values. Think about that. Because the people... In a case where you have a, a moral people, a virtuous people, when they said virtue, they meant the Bible. That's what they meant. They didn't mean the Quran or any other book. They meant the Bible when they said virtue back then. So when they said that it could only exist, freedom, liberty can only exist in the law, they meant God's law. When they said virtue, they meant God's virtue. They meant the Bible, the word of God is what they meant. Because the people police themselves. It makes sense. Look at what's happening today. People are using this word freedom to just take freedom to all these immoral, disgusting extremes. That's not what the foundation, it's not freedom to be a pervert. It's not freedom to harm. It's not freedom to harass. It's not freedom to murder. That's what people, keep your hands off my body. You don't have the freedom to kill somebody. What is wrong with these people? You don't have the freedom to murder people. I mean, you wouldn't think that you would have to explain this to people, but this is where we're at today. 
This is not freedom. So guess what? Guess what? More princes will come. More princes will come. Less freedom will come. It's just, it's just going to happen. If this keeps going in this direction, we keep rejecting the Lord in this country, that's what's going to happen. At least, look, at least we know, if, if we know the Bible and we study the Bible, we know why things are going to happen. I mean, at least we can take that um, solace. So, I mean, to conclude, I mean, to conclude, to just wrap this up this morning, look, I appreciate what we have remaining today. I appreciate the opportunities that I've had in this country. I appreciate the opportunities that we still have in this country. I appreciate because, look, it's important for our mission. It's important for us that we have some liberty today so we can, we can get the word of God out. That's important. We need to use, so we need to use that inheritance. But look, our country, all that to say, was we're squandering what we were given over 200 years ago, just like the prodigal son squandered his entire inheritance. The problem, folks, in this country is us. It's not us, but it's, our, it's the people in this country. That's the problem. So look, I mean, I, I vote when there's somebody to vote for. I am so happy that Roe v. Wade got overturned. I, I'm just, I'm thrilled about that. You all know that. That's great. I'm happy that we have a Second Amendment. I'm happy that we can have private property. I'm happy for freedom and liberty in general. And that's something to celebrate today. That there's still a remnant of that. That we still have something to use in that area. That we still have an inheritance that we can build off of. We don't want to be the prodigal son. And that's what I'll talk to you about this evening. But look. Our, you know, did you know that our country, this country, has done more to spread the gospel around the world than any other country in the, in the history of the world? I mean, did you know 15% of Americans are, are ident they identify as Baptist? I mean, that, look, my faith does not lie in politics and, and judges and all these things, but there's, there's an inheritance that we can use. But if ultimately, if, if we as a nation, we squander this whole thing, if we squander the whole thing, you know, because look, payment is coming. Payment is coming and you can't fight the Lord. We know that. I'm just happy to be part of the remnant. I'm happy to be part of the remnant. I appreciate what we're, we're I can appreciate what I was given. I don't have to appreciate where it's going. So that's how I can look at this country in a positive attitude. I don't want to squander what I've been given but I understand why it's going away. And maybe it's because, you know, maybe it's because part of the problem is, is that when you don't work for something, you don't appreciate it. I think part of the problem in this country is there's just been too many good times for too many people. You know, they haven't had to work for that liberty. They haven't had to keep working for that. And look, the, tip, the more you don't work for something, the more prone you are to waste it. That's what happened with this boy. He was just given all that money. And he just wasted the whole thing. Go back to Luke chapter 5. And let's end here. Go back to I'm Luke chapter uh, 15, sorry. Go back to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Look at verse 14. The Bible says, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Isn't that interesting? And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have feigned to have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He wasted everything, and then there was a mighty famine, and then he had nothing. That will be this country if we continue down the same road that we're continuing down. So am I proud to be an American? No, I don't think I'm better than anybody else because uh, I'm an American, but I appreciate the blessings of this country, what was handed down to me, as Psalm 16 says, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places, yea, I have a goodly heritage. That's how I feel, being born in this country. Especially when I see people that have come and struggled to get here from other countries. And you'll see that, by the way. I, m I knew a man from um, Korea who, who came to this country after the Vietnam War. I worked with him for several years, and he came to this country right after the Vietnam War because an American soldier who was in Vietnam met his family when this soldier was in Vietnam and this, this soldier went back and became a pastor in Texas and he raised all this money within a year to get this, this 
father, his wife, and like these five children into the United States to bring these people over. And you had to make this, this boat ride, I think, down to the Philippines um, to get um, to a safe spot where that you could get picked up. And this man was a son of the man who this pastor knew. And all three of his sisters and his brother died in that boat going to... Um, it was the second boat because what they tried to do is they tried to get the boys out first because the boys were all being sent. The boys of South Vietnam, after the Americans left the country, all the boys of South Vietnam were being sent to Cambodia to fight. And they were all being killed. It was like, you just, we went to Cambodia, you're dead. So it was a rush. They got the boys out first and the boys made it. But the mom, the dad, and the girls all died. And I mean, you, I mean, you, you know, you, you listen to this story and I mean, this guy appreciated this country. I was, I was like 22, 23 when I knew this man and he was probably in his 40s at this time and he'd sit there and he would just cry and tell that story and he appreciated this country. So we should appreciate what we have here today. And we should, we should strive to, to take that inheritance and do as much as we possibly can with it. And that's what I'll talk to you about this evening. Someone who, how to, how to be someone who doesn't squander that inheritance that they've been given. Let's bow our heads.